We now return to the Sunday Night Movie, My Half-Brother Vinny. Because you deserted your post, an enemy force was able to penetrate security, free Serpentor, and injure three good men. You're confined to quarters until court-martial. Don't do it, Hawk. He's my half-brother, Vinny. Get him out of my sight. You have to bail me out, you know that, right? Hello everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here. This is the show where we review every vintage G.I. Joe toy from 1982 to 1994. This time we are looking at Falcon. Or is it Lieutenant Falcon? Or is it Falcone? Or Falcone? He's definitely a green beret though, except when he's wearing a black beret. The most important thing about this character is that he was the half-brother of Duke. Except for when he wasn't. The animated character was voiced by Don Johnson once, and then the other times, somebody else. This version of Falcon was in the Super Sonic Fighters. Now, that's a very special set of action figures where Hasbro helpfully provided technology for kids who didn't know how to go pew-pew and bang-bang. They needed electronics to do this for them. This figure was released in 1991, maybe, or 1992. I'm not really sure. Let's find out. Or maybe we won't. Hooded Cobra Commander 788 presents Falcon. This is Lieutenant Falcon G.I. Joe's Green Beret from 1991 or 1992. Either way, it was discontinued by 1993. This is the third vintage version of Falcon. There's some confusion about when this figure was released. Yojo.com has it on the 1992 page, but says it was released in 1991. The Ultimate Guide by Mark Belomo has it in the 1991 chapter. The official G.I. Joe collector's book also lists it as a 1991 figure, and the card back advertises 1991 figures and includes the 1991 Sonic Fighters with the Super Sonic Fighters as if they're one set. Based on the catalog, the Super Sonic Fighters were released in 1992. The 1991 catalog says they are coming soon, and they are in the 1992 catalog. So which is it? My best guess is that it was released late in 1991, too late to be included in the 1991 catalog and carried over to 1992. This figure was designed by Ron Rudat for Hasbro. It was designed for release in 1987 and just recolored for this release. I refer to this figure as Falcon because that's what he was called in 1987 when he was first released, but really this figure is Lieutenant Falcon, and indeed he is a lieutenant. Sometimes the rank was added to his codename. Falcon version 1 was released in 1987. The figure had a camouflage uniform and a green beret. He looked really great. He was one of the best figures that year. Falcon version 2 was released in 1988. It was part of the Night Force subset. It used the same mold as version 1, but in different colors. Since version 3 from the Supersonic Fighters used the same mold as version 1, all three figures are the same except for the coloring. Green beret refers to U.S. Army Special Forces. The members wear a specific headdress, the Green Beret. The 10th Special Forces Group was formed in 1952. The Special Forces branch of the U.S. Army was established in 1987, the same year the first Falcon figure was released. Green Berets became pop culture icons through movies and music. The song The Ballad of the Green Berets by Sergeant Barry Sadler was released in 1966. The John Wayne movie The Green Berets was released in 1968. The novel First Blood by David Morrill was published in 1972, and it was turned into a movie starring Sylvester Stallone in 1982. By the time the first Falcon action figure was released in 1987, most American kids would know what a Green Beret was. Falcon version 3 was in the Super Sonic Fighters subset that was one of the Sonic G.I. Joe sets. They all had sound-making gimmicks. The first of those sets was the 1991 Sonic Fighters. They had huge backpacks 
tracks with sound effects speakers. That group was followed by the 1991 or 1992 Super Sonic Fighters. They had more huge backpacks with sound effects speakers. The Super Sonic Fighters cards include the Sonic Fighters in the cross-sell portion, so they may be considered a second wave of Sonic Fighters with a slightly different name. Also in 1992, there was the Talking Battle Commanders. They had more huge backpacks, but this time they were screwed into the backs of the figures. They had speakers with sampled voice and sound effects. There were two vehicles with the Sonic labels, both released in 1992. The Desert Apache was labeled Sonic Fighters, and Fort America was labeled Super Sonic Fighters. Also in 1992, the G.I. Joe headquarters had a sound-making device. There was going to be another sound-playing set called Battle Scan in 1993, but that set was cancelled, and the 1993 line was renamed Battle Core. Falcon was the main character in the 1987 G.I. Joe animated movie. He was voiced by Don Johnson. The original plan was that he would be related to Hawk in some way. That changed to make him Duke's half-brother. The idea the idea of making Falcon related to another Joe came from Buzz Dixon, writer and story editor for the series and the movie. He wanted to make Falcon the son of Hawk, but the decision was made by higher-ups to have him related to Duke. I have the full card back for this figure. Unfortunately, most of the front of the card is ripped off. Because of the way this figure was packaged, it was difficult to remove the plastic blister without ripping off most of the front of the card, and that's exactly what happened here. There's the G.I. Joe logo at the top with the Supersonic Fighters logo next to it. It's partially ripped and partially covered by a Bradley's price sticker, also partially ripped. The Supersonic Fighters Fighters card backs had this really gross salmon colored background with these circles that were supposed to represent sound waves. We have the card art with Falcon doing such a crazy scream that it looks like his jaw is unhinged. Not only is most of the art torn away, it's also partially covered by this promotional sticker. The card promises four battle sounds including laser pistol, machine gun, laser rifle, and pistol. We will test those out. Looking at the back of the card, we have this cross cell with this partition for the Sonic Fighters that also includes the Super Sonic Fighters. Then we have this other section with the rest of the figures that were available at the time. We have a single flag point and we have the file card that is unfortunately also in that salmon color. We will take a closer look at the file card later in this video. Unlike most file cards of the era, this file card has a description of some of the accessories and I will refer to this when talking about those accessories. I I have a modern Falcon figure. This is part of the G.I. Joe classified series of 6-inch action figures released this year. This is based on the version 1 Falcon figure, not version 3, but we can look at it to see an up-to-date representation of this character. This action figure is somewhat controversial, so let's take a look at it and see if we can figure out why. Let's take a look at the box, and this box is one of the no-plastic boxes, which can be a good thing or a bad thing. These boxes give a lot more packaging real estate for the artwork, and if the artwork is good, then it gives us more good artwork. But if the artwork is bad or mediocre, there's just more bad or mediocre artwork. I wouldn't say this is bad, but it's definitely not my preference. We have a pose here on the front of Pouty Falcon, and we have some colors with a lot of blues in it. Does not show a lot of the details of the figure, which is important because this figure is highly detailed, but you don't get that from the packaging artwork. One of the reasons we praise the classic card art is because it made these lumps of plastic look more lifelike, and unfortunately this card art and some of the other card art in the classified series takes these somewhat lifelike figures and makes them look less lifelike. So we have Pouty Falcon on the front. We have a photo of the action figure. This is in the G.I. Joe Classified series, and this is Vincent R. Falcon, Falcone, or Falcone. This is a reversion to the previous spelling of the last name. We'll get to that when we talk about the vintage figure's file card. On the side of the box, we have Falcon parachuting to the ground, looking less pouty. This is number 64 in the Classified series. 
these. And on the back of the box, we have more photos of the figure and accessories. There are these symbols that represent his specialties, and those symbols are copied on the side of the box. This one means he is really fast, like the Flash. This is four R2-D2s. This means there's a footnote. And this is two balloons. They should be red, and there are 97 more of them, but they wouldn't fit in the frame. Let's take Falcon out of the box. I have previously opened this figure to take a look at it, and I put it back in the box. So this is not a fresh unboxing, but I can show you how it was boxed. The figure comes in this cardboard tray. It was originally tied to the tray, but I've clipped those ties so I can take the figure out. Inside the box, there is also another box that contains the accessories. Here is Classified Falcon out of the box. This figure is obviously based on version 1 from 1987. In my opinion, version 1 is a far superior figure for reasons I shall discuss. Let's start by looking at the accessories, and the first one we need to look at is the hat. The green beret includes a green beret. It is in green plastic, obviously. It is in a soft, flexible plastic, which I like. I prefer that. And I don't really have a problem with this. It's a good color. It's a good shape. It fits on the head really well. It has a black beret flash with a yellow stripe, just like the vintage figure. In fact, this is a really good representation of the beret on the vintage figure, but on the classified figure, of course, it is removable. On version one, it is not. Next, we have the backpack, and this backpack is pretty nice. It has a lot of detail. Uh, it is a communications backpack with an antenna, and it has a rope here, a couple canteens. It also has a removable knife, and that knife has a gray handle and a silver blade. The knife will slide into this sheath on the side of the backpack, and this, of course, mirrors the backpack on the vintage figure, which was also a green communications backpack with two canteens, a rope molded on, and a knife that would fit on the side. The next accessory is the shotgun, and this is where we start to have a problem. It doesn't look like the vintage shotgun, which was black and more of a traditional shotgun, but that's not the problem. This shotgun is gray in color with brown furniture. It has a two-piece folding stock and some green shotgun shells on that stock. So far, so good. Unfortunately, there are two major problems with this shotgun, at least my example of it. The shoulder brace on this folding stock is very loose and, in fact, will just pop off. It is not on there securely at all, and I've tried to put it on there more securely so it won't fall off. Because it comes off so easily, my only option is to keep this folded. The other problem is this. Right out of the package, it was very bent, as if it were stored in a tight location, and it is permanently bent like this. I've tried to fix it. I've tried various ways to straighten it out. So far, nothing has worked. So I have a apparently permanently bent shotgun for Falcon. Those are all the accessories that were separate from the figure. The figure itself has some accessories that are on it. You could remove them, but they're not really intended to be removed. We will look at those, but first let's look at the articulation. This figure has standard classified articulation, so two points of articulation at the neck and at the head, so good range of motion. Butterfly joints at the shoulders, up at the shoulder, swivel at the shoulder, swivel at the bicep, double jointed elbows, swivel at the wrist, and up and down hinges on both wrists, hinge at the rib cage and ball joint at the hip for an ab crunch and a swivel at the hip, legs split apart, there is a swivel at the thigh cut that is really tight on this one, but you can get it to move. Double jointed knees. He has a swivel at the boot cut, and he has hinged and rocker ankles. Let's look at the figure itself. I have some problems with this figure, and you may have already spotted some of them. Let's start with the head, and this head is not great. This is what most people complain about. His lips are very red. This may be some of Jinx's lipstick he has on his lips. The lips are bad, but that's 
that's not my biggest problem with this head. The hair is fine, so hey, that's one thing. Uh, the face is kind of ugly, but that is okay. That's not really a huge problem. Not every face has to look attractive, but this face just doesn't seem to be very well sculpted. For one thing, the eyes look uneven. The right eye seems to slide more down the skull than the left eye. They're not symmetrical, and it's just kind of odd and a bit off-putting. Also, how old is he supposed to be? He has deep lines around his mouth. He has sunken cheeks. He looks much older than you would expect him to be as a Lieutenant Green Beret. I don't always agree with popular complaints about action figures, but this is one instance where I do agree. I just don't think this is very good. So let's move on. He has a green bandana that wraps around his neck and has a tie in the front that is a separate piece, and I do like that. He has his load-bearing equipment, this piece that goes over his shoulders and connects in the back that also connects to a belt that is in a lighter green than the uniform, kind of a pale green, but not the tan color that was on the vintage figure. So it's a bit of a subtle contrast. On the right side shoulder, he has this silver and blue device that we have seen on other G.I. Joe action figures, which we assume is a communications device, I guess. He has a brown painted knife on the right strap and a couple pouches on the left strap. This knife is molded on and not really removable, and I don't really like this. This is a trend we are starting to see with classified figures with having these sculpted on weapons that are not removable, which is totally understandable on a three and three quarter inch figure, but on a six inch scale figure, I feel like these accessories ought to be removable and not just decorative. The straps are attached to a belt that is in the same lighter green color. The belt has some pouches on the side and one in the front. It has a silver belt buckle with a bit of paint over spray, and there is an extension under the belt for the shirt. So the uniform shirt uh, is kind of attached to the belt to look like it's tucked under the belt. I guess that's the only way they could do that. I understand what they were going for, and they were trying to copy a detail that was on the vintage figure, but this is a very risky choice. Uh, for one thing, if there is any color difference between this plastic and the plastic on the action figure, that's not going to look right. Also, since this shirt tail is part of the belt piece, if the belt piece moves, the shirt also moves, and that can also look rather awkward. The uniform is in a dark green color. He has rolled up sleeves. He has a green watch on his left wrist with painted watch hands. That's a nice touch. The dark green uniform has a brown camouflage on it, and that's the same on the top and the bottom half of the uniform. He's got some pockets on the legs. He's got a texture pattern on the legs. I do like that texture pattern. He has some jungle boots with a lighter green canvas color on the sides, and that's pretty close to the color on the straps. He has gray boots under those boot covers. I don't know if it's coming out well on this camera, but I can barely see the camouflage pattern. There's not much contrast between the dark brown and the dark green, and I understand not everything needs to be high contrast. I get it, but with such a low contrast camouflage, it's almost like there's no camouflage at all. It's a waste of a paint spray that doesn't really show up on the figure very well. Contrast this with the version 1 camouflage, which had a lighter base green color, an actual olive green color with darker green camouflage on it. This looks so much better, and it looks like the tiger stripe camouflage used by real Vietnam-era Green Beret soldiers. This looks great, and this one, I'm afraid the colors are just too subtle to really pick up on the camouflage. To summarize, I have multiple problems with this figure. I do agree with the criticisms of the face. The accessories are mostly good, but I have a serious problem with my shotgun that so far I have not been able to fix. I think the version 1 figure is superior to this modern 6-inch figure, and that's unfortunate because Falcon is a popular character, and this was a great opportunity to give us a really cool figure, and I think it just fell short. Let's take a look at Falcon's accessories, and he came with a few. Neither of these weapons fit in his hands very well, and I'm not going to force it because I don't want to break the thumbs. The first is this machine gun. It is in black plastic. 
It has a simple design, kind of generic looking. The file card says it's a 5.56 millimeter XAR2 automatic assault rifle. I don't know what else to say about it. It's kind of a basic looking GI Joe machine gun. Next we have this laser rifle and this is an unusual one. It is in black plastic. It has a grip on the top and an arm brace that looks really strange. It has a scope, but how would you use it with the grip on the top? The card calls this a scatter blast laser rifle with laser tracking sensors. Both of these weapons are probably a little too similar and neither is like his original shotgun. Next, he includes a figure stand in black plastic. This is one of the things I love about 90s figures. They included figure stands. 1980s G.I. Joe figures did not include figure stands. Next, we get to the backpack, this Sonic backpack. It is in blue plastic. It has a black rotor with curved blades and those blades will spin. It has a lot of technical detail and it has four gray buttons and two red lights. I guess this is supposed to make him fly but the rotor is probably too small to lift him and there's no tail blade or counter rotating blade so even if it did lift him he would spin around in the air. Each of these four gray rubbery buttons will make a sound and they will make these lights light up on the top. I don't know if that's coming across very well on my camera, but those will light up. This button makes a laser sound. This button makes a gun sound. This button makes a machine gun sound. And this button makes another laser sound. The card says these sounds are laser pistol, machine gun, laser rifle, and pistol. I can identify the machine gun and maybe the pistol, but which one is the laser rifle and which is the laser pistol? And why these sounds? The figure doesn't come with any kind of pistol, laser or otherwise. Let's look at the articulation on Falcon. He had the articulation that was standard for G.I. Joe figures in 1991 and in 1992, and indeed in 1987 when Falcon was first released. So he could turn his head from left to right and look up and down. He could lift his arm up at the shoulder and swivel at the shoulder all the way around. He had a hinge at the elbow so he could bend his arm at the elbow about 90 degrees. He had a swivel at the bicep so he could swivel his arm all the way around. This was an O-ring figure that allowed him to move at the torso a bit. He could move his legs apart about so far. He could move his leg at the hip about 90 degrees and bend at the knee about 90 degrees. Let's look at the sculpt design and color of Falcon. Once again, he uses the same mold as version one and version two, just in different colors. Looking at the head, he has a green beret, which is appropriate. He has a black beret flash. Which unit is this supposed to be? On the version one file card, the beret flash looked like the 5th Special Forces group with some kind of badge on it. This one is just black. Also, he has black hair instead of the brown hair on version 1. Looking at the chest, he has a light gray uniform with a black digital camouflage pattern. He has a black scarf around the neck tied in the front. He has a communications microphone on the right shoulder. On the version 1 figure, this would have worked with his radio backpack. I guess the huge helicopter backpack could also have a radio in it. He has black straps on the chest and he has a green knife on the right side strap and a green pouch on the left side strap. He also has this green device on the left side. Looking at his arms, he has light gray sleeves rolled up over his elbows. He has a black watch on his left wrist. He has no camouflage on the sleeves, which looks a little odd, but I guess they had to cut some paint somewhere. On the waist piece, he has a black belt with black pouches on the belt. He has a shirt tucked under the belt. His uniform is light gray with a black camouflage pattern. Moving on to his legs, he has gray legs with a black camouflage pattern. He has pockets on the outside upper legs. He has a molded on flashlight on the front of the right pocket. The camouflage goes right over it so it doesn't stand out well. 
This is a detail that is totally lost if it isn't painted. We finish with some light gray boots that are the same color as the uniform, so really they are unpainted boots. The colors are quite different from version 1. I like the version 1 figure better, as it looks more like a Vietnam-era camouflage uniform. Despite this, I like the version 3 colors. They aren't loud or obnoxious. The gray and black pattern looks like an urban camouflage. I don't even mind the unpainted boots. I do mind the camouflage pattern going over the flashlight on the leg. It's like they're intentionally trying to cover up that detail. And the camouflage pattern should continue on the arms as well. Overall, I'd say I like these colors more than the Night Force version. Let's take a look at Falcon's file card. It is in that pinkish salmon color, and I hate it. It has his faction as G.I. Joe. It has a portrait of Falcon with his dislocated jaw scream. It has his code name as Lieutenant Falcon, and he is a Green Beret. His file name is Vincent R. Falcon, which is different from his version 1 file card, which had his file name as Vincent R. Falcone, or Falcone. Looks like they dropped the E. Was that a typo, or were they just trying to make his real name match his code name? His primary military specialty is infantry, his secondary military specialty is medic, his birthplace is Fayetteville, North Carolina, and his grade is O2 First Lieutenant. Fayetteville, North Carolina is near Fort Bragg, the base for Army Special Forces Command. If Falcon is really from the 5th Special Forces Group, then he would be based in Fort Campbell, Kentucky. The first file card does specify he was with the 5th SFGA Blue Light Counterterrorism Unit. There's an asterisk by the serial number, and at the bottom it says, Lieutenant Falcon's security number has been specially modified to prevent breaches in G.I. Joe security. Maybe they also very slightly changed his name for that purpose, too. This top paragraph says, A second-generation Special Forces trooper, Lieutenant Falcon has snake-eating and jumping out of airplanes in his blood. A qualified expert in all NATO and Soviet bloc small arms, he can field strip, clean, and reassemble most common military pistols, submachine guns, and assault rifles in complete darkness and not wind up with leftover parts. Especially trained to maintain and modify all of the Sonic Fighter's innovative and highly advanced weapon systems. Lieutenant Falcon is also cross-trained in demolitions, medicine, and languages, in parentheses, Spanish, French, Arabic, and Swahili. The first paragraph rewords the version 1 file card. It's like when you had to write a book report, but you weren't allowed to directly copy the text, so you just changed the words around a bit. The second paragraph has a quote. It says, Falcon knows that the only kind of respect that's worth having is the kind that's EARNED! Sorry, it's in all caps, so I assumed it's yelling. It's the kind that's earned and not handed out with rank. When you go stepping out into bad guy country with Falcon, you can depend on him to pull his own weight and put his butt on the line when the worst possible scenario becomes a bone-chilling reality. He leads by example and to a grunt in the field. That's the best kind of leadership, bar none. This file card is not badly written. It does have some promo for the Sonic Fighters, and it cribs some notes from the version 1 file card, and it has some odd differences from the version 1 card, like the spelling of the name, but other than that, it's pretty well done. The file card is nothing like the character in the cartoon. That character had a different personality and background, and the card has no mention of a relation to Duke. Looking at how Falcon was used in G.I. Joe media, he first appeared in animated form in the 1987 G.I. Joe movie. He was voiced by Don Johnson. The movie is quite divisive, and I'm not a fan of it. In the movie, Falcon Falcon was portrayed as irresponsible. He brought a date to G.I. Joe headquarters, who turned out to be Zarana in disguise. He also left his post before Cobra infiltrated the base. There were two important relationships for Falcon. He was romantically interested in Jinx, though she didn't really show an interest in him until the end of the movie. Also, he was revealed to be Duke's half-brother. The original plan was for Falcon to be related to Hawk in some way, either a brother or a son. This was changed to make him the half-brother of Duke. 
This was a choice of the writers of the movie. There's no hint of this on the file card. The version 1 file card says he's second generation Green Beret. If he were Hawk's son, that would make Hawk the first generation Green Beret. There's no mention of Special Forces experience on Hawk's file cards. That's about the only thing he didn't do. After facing the possibility of court-martial, Falcon was sent to the Slaughterhouse, where he met Sergeant Slaughter and the Renegades. When Duke defended Falcon from Serpentor's spear and went into a coma, Falcon changed his attitude and became the hero of the movie. After the movie, the animated series produced by Sunbow was cancelled. There was a gap before Deke took over production and started a new series. Falcon was in that series, but not very much. Online sources say in the Deke series he was voiced by actor Scott McNeil, but I have not been able to confirm that. He didn't have many appearances, and he's mainly known for two episodes, The Greatest Evil Parts 1 and 2. In those episodes, Falcon gets addicted to a drug called Spark, sold by the evil drug dealer Headman. G.I. Joe and Cobra combined forces to combat their common enemy. Falcon was most known for being selfish, irresponsible, and a drug addict. He just couldn't catch a break in the cartoon. Falcon fared a bit better in the comic book series published by Marvel Comics, which is surprising. In the comic, he didn't have a relation to Duke, and he wasn't the focus of the story like he was in the movie. He first appeared in issue number 60. That also introduced Chuckles, Fast Draw, and Law and & Order. They were deceived into thinking they were members of G.I. Joe in a plot to fire a missile at Cobra Island. They helped Hawk defeat the plot, so Hawk made them official G.I. Joes. I guess they got to skip the Joe qualification process. This issue was surprisingly like an episode of the animated series. A bunch of characters were introduced in a one-off story, and they were officially adopted on the G.I. Joe team because of their proximity to the action. This is also the issue that was drawn by Todd McFarlane. I wish I could say it has aged well and looks better in hindsight, but... No, it's still pretty bad. Some of the panel compositions are awkward and hard to follow. Some of the stylistic choices are just strange. In issue number 73, Falcon led a team that infiltrated Cobra Island. Later, when the Cobra Civil War broke out, Falcon's team were the first boots on the ground. He had a few appearances here and there, and turned up again in issues number 108 through 111, during the war in the fictional Middle Eastern country of Trucial Abyssinia. He wasn't related to Duke, but he was present with Duke when several Joes were mowed down and killed by the Saw Viper. It was Falcon who put a stop to the massacre with a well-thrown knife. That was it. Falcon was never a main character and didn't have much to do in the comic book series, but his few appearances were more positive than the animated show. Looking at Falcon overall, I like this figure. I don't like it as much as the first version, but I like it more than in the second version, the colors give it an urban camouflage look with striking contrast. I really like the digital camouflage. The accessories I mostly can do without. The giant backpack was the selling point of this figure and the other figures in the Supersonic Fighters line, but it is ridiculously oversized, and all to have an electronic sound maker that doesn't do any better than you can do yourself. Pew, 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 pew! See? This is a review of version 3. It's not a full review of the classified Falcon figure, but I have looked at it for this video, and I've got to say I prefer version 1 of Falcon to the classified figure. I prefer version 2 and version 3 of Falcon to the classified figure. So many missed opportunities. I wish the whole thing had been done a little better. The character of Falcon is the big question mark. In his debut, he was irresponsible and selfish, and he was related to Duke. He was Duke's half-brother. In a couple of his later animated appearances, he was a drug addict and still related to Duke. That is in stark contrast to the character as portrayed on the file card, and in in the comic book, that character was really made for animation. The character on the final card is second generation special forces, highly disciplined and skilled, and that's pretty much how he was portrayed in the comic book. I'm going to go out on a limb here. This isn't usually how my judgment falls on these things, but I'm going to say that the flawed character in animation 
is more interesting than the character on the file card or in the comic book. The Falcon you got as a toy and in the comic book series was a super soldier guy with lots of combat experience, exactly the kind of guy you would want on the G.I. Joe team. In animation, he was none of that, which makes it less plausible that he would be on the team. In fact, there's some implied nepotism there, but the character is at least more interesting, and you can do more with that kind of character. He has room to grow. This does not mean I now like the 1987 animated movie. No, I'm still not a fan. I'm just saying that you can do more with a character as flawed as that Falcon than you can with the character that we saw on the file card and in the comic book. That character was just a bit more bland. Coming back around to version 3 of Lieutenant Falcon, I think this is a fine figure. I would do away with most of the accessories and maybe give him one of the shotguns from version 1, and then you've got a pretty good figure. That was my review of Lieutenant Falcon version 3 from the Super Sonic Fighters. I hope you enjoyed it. Next week, I will not have a new review because I will be in Augusta, Georgia for Joe Fest I hope you will come out and see me there. In the meantime, please give this video a thumbs up on YouTube, subscribe to the YouTube channel, share this video with your friends. You can find me on social media, on Facebook and Twitter, and I have a website, hcc788.com. Cobra Convergence 7 is coming up very soon, so you will want to check hcc788.com for updates as we get closer to the event in July. Special thanks to my friends on Patreon. I could not do these videos without without their help. If you like these videos, please consider supporting the channel on Patreon. You can get some special perks like early access, and you can get your name in videos like the names you see scrolling on the screen right now. I will see you in Georgia next week, and I will see you after that for Cobra Convergence 7. Until then, remember, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe. Don't do it, Hawk. He's my half-brother, Vinny.